how radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is the Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome to the Yaron Brook Show on this uh, Friday, April 5th. I am broadcasting to you from uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, in my hotel room. Um, so far, so good with the internet. It, it, the internet's been stable, and uh, we didn't do so well a couple of days ago from Sao Paulo, where uh, the internet basically died after I tried that episode. There was basically no internet in my room for, for 24 hours afterwards. So there we go. Uh, breaking news. We're getting it on the chat, really. But uh, I, I have seen it reported um, that uh, there was an earthquake uh, this uh, just a little bit while ago, a little while ago in New York City, of all places, New York and New Jersey, a 4.8 magnitude earthquake, which is very unusual. Uh, and uh, there was slight shaking felt as far north as Hartford, Connecticut, as far south as Wilmington. Uh, and um, no reports of damages or injuries yet, but there is disruption uh, disruption in the New York metro area uh, at, at both the, uh, let's see, the Newark airport. Uh, yeah, it looks like New Newark airport. Uh, lots of, lots of planes holding patterns, not not landing. So yeah, definitely, um, definitely uh, uh, some uh, people felt it. Uh, Dave says uh, it was pretty significant. He felt it. Uh, did, he it woke me up. Woke me up. That's good because you got to catch the. I mean, Dave is waking up at eleven o'clock Eastern time. That's good. Must have had a long night. Hopefully, it was uh, rewarding. Um, all right. Uh, so yeah, unusual. Also, I, I was going to talk about this, but since we're talking about earthquakes, there was a big earthquake, seven point two, in Taiwan. Uh, when was it? Yesterday or the day before yesterday? Uh, <clears throat> you know that's that's a big earthquake, and it was it was right inland. It was right on the coast, so it was uh, uh, it was right in a populated area. A number of buildings I saw collapsed. Uh, last I heard, there were something like nine hundred people missing, but I haven't really kept up with the story. Uh, it, you know, uh, uh, in um, Taiwan is on the belt of fire with with Japan and and other places in Asia. And a lot of earthquakes over there, and they're prepared for them, and they're ready for them. An earthquake like that, and pretty much anywhere else in the world, would cause dramatic damage. Uh, one of the interesting reports coming out of that uh, 7.2 earthquake in Taiwan was that TSMC, largest chip manufacturer in the world, the most sophisticated chip manufacturer in the world, um, didn't hurt production, didn't hurt uh, the assembly line, it, it seems like. They uh, they were ready for it, and they built they built those things. They have, as Rob says in the chat, earthquake mastery, earthquake mastery. I think many of the countries on that belt of fire do. Japan and uh, although Japan has had some really devastating earthquakes, or some really that have been incredibly destructive. Of course, they also had the tsunami. Luckily, this one. I think was onshore, so it did, you didn't get the tsunami effect, uh, but you did get the earthquake. Uh, Jennifer says Alaska is also on the ring of fire. Yes, it, it, it really is. California is on the ring of fire too, right? It really goes up California coast all the way to Alaska, across, and then down through the Pacific on that other side. So um, uh, it's, uh, but New York, New York had an earthquake. Go figure. All right. Uh, let's jump in. Uh, this morning we got uh, employment numbers, uh, unemploy unemployment numbers and employment numbers. And that, that is the number of new uh, payrolls. Uh, the market was waiting for this. Um, and payrolls jumped by, th by 300,000. So 303,000 new jobs, in a sense, were created based on th this particular measure. That is significantly, 50% higher the what uh, economists and analysts were expecting. So this is much better performance for the economy than what people were expecting. Uh, unemployment dropped to 3.8, but the real important number is the number of jobs created. Uh, it, this is good news and bad news for the stock market. So it's good news in the sense that the economy is humming along, again, in spite of 
everybody's complaints in spite of uh, everybody being convinced that this is the worst economy ever and all of that, the economy just keeps humming along and uh, 300,000 new jobs is a significant number, uh, a, a significant number in a month, in any month, uh, and again, 50% higher than anybody was expecting. The question now is, uh, is, and this is based on conventional economic theory, is this a reflection that inflation is continuing, that inflation is not being, you know, uh, put under control, uh, or is or is this independent of inflation? To what extent is this caused by the false signals of an inflationary economy? Because if inflation is continuing, then we can expect the Federal Reserve to either maintain high interest rates for a longer period of time or actually increase interest rates. The market is actually anticipating later this year the Fed decreasing interest rates. But if the economy is buzzing, is, is, is growing significantly, the Fed will not decrease interest rates. So the market has to weigh these two factors. On the one hand, the economy is doing really, really well. On the other hand, interest rates might stay high. As I've told you before, everything else held constant. If interest rates go down, asset prices go up, including stocks, right? Interest rates go down, asset prices go up. Everything else held constant, which is never the case. So the market was anticipating interest rates going up, down, and therefore the stock market going up. But now it looks like interest rates might not go down. But offsetting that is the fact that the economy is doing well and job creation is really good, and maybe that's good enough. So again, you've got these offsetting factors. The, 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 the stock market this morning, when I looked, was fairly flat because they can't decide which effect is a greater effect. Um, and, and, you know, this really is going to be interesting election-wise. That is, uh, do Americans with 300,000 new jobs created, do Americans continue to feel uh, badly about the economy and, and do they resent Biden because of it? Or as j if job creation continues like this, and by the way, if interest rates stay up, then they're paying higher interest rates, they have higher mortgages, higher credit card fees, all of that, and therefore they feel poor, so the extra jobs don't matter. And as a consequence, they blame Biden and they vote for Trump. Or uh, is this increased job creation, can they go together with ultimately lowering interest rates later in the year and slowly Americans feeling better about the economy and uh, Biden gets elected because uh, people give him credit for managing this economy? Uh, really, really hard to tell. But uh, it, it, overall, I think you have to say to find the perspective of, <laughs> of us of, of people participating in the economy, this is good news. The, the, the economy is doing well. It, you know, we, we're expecting, I was expecting, pretty much everybody was expecting we would be in a recession right now, and we are not. Uh, and this is, uh, we're, we're in, a, in an economy that's, that's growing fairly nicely. And under those circumstances, it, 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 again, it will be interesting to see how markets respond and, um, and how everything else is happening. Uh, you know, the numbers are the numbers. Uh, people have emotions and feelings about how the economy is doing, uh, but the reality is that the, the, by, these are the same numbers calculated in the same way as they've been calculated for at least the last 15 years. Uh, they, they did change how these numbers are calculated sometimes in the 70s and 80s. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, it's hard to argue with the numbers. The fact is that uh, we, we, job creation has been outstanding over the last uh, couple of years, and, uh, and that is surprising and uh, probably won't last long term because a lot of this is a, a consequence of government spending. A lot of this is the subsidies. A lot of this is the CHIP Act and the Inflation Reduction Act and all of that where the government is spending money that it, it really doesn't have and that creates short-term economic growth at the expense of the long-term. But the short-term economic growth is there, and, and people can pretend it doesn't exist. People can pretend the economy is horrible. People can pretend people are, are out there dramatically struggling. But the reality is that people are buying lots of stuff. Um, they are taking on credit card debt, but usually people take on credit card debt when they feel optimistic about the ability to pay it back. And it's hard 
it's hard to justify the kind of uh, negative perspective people have out there. Now, gold prices are very high right now. They're at 23.15. I think yesterday they hit an all-time ever high. But it's really hard to interpret gold prices. A gold price is an inflation hedge. That means that today with these job numbers, they, gold should have gone up, and yet gold went down today. Um, are they a end-of-the-world hedge? And as uh, geopolitical uncertainty rises, gold prices go up? That, I think, is more likely. That is, with Israel bombing Iran, the Iranian embassy, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, it, it, that has increased uh, tensions in the Middle East and certainly increased the possibility that Iran is going to launch a major attack against Israel or even against the United States. That increases geopolitical tensions. That raises gold prices. The same with, with the, what's happening in Ukraine and Russia, uh, Ukraine attacking Russian refineries. And in a sense, that is a, uh, that is, uh, a, you know, a, a kind of next step in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the, uh, um, you know, in terms of that war. Um, in terms of how many of these jobs are, um, are part-time or full-time, um, I mean, uh, the, the labor participation rate moved higher, uh, so it, it went up, so more people are working, which is, which is good in terms of the number of people available. Um, now, if you, if you look at, let me just see, uh, wages rose 0.3%, which is 4.1 from a year ago, which is in line with Wall Street expectations and a, and a relatively high rate. Um, uh, and then, uh, let's see, uh, growth in employment came usually uh, from the usual sectors, healthcare 72%, government 72,000, government 71,000, lesion hospitality 49,000. Uh, and let's see, I'm looking for the numbers for part-time. I really don't see the numbers for part-time. Um, but, you know, the reality is, and this has been true for a long time, the reality is that this economy is creating jobs. People are gaining jobs. Uh, remember, we've also got massive illegal immigration coming in, right? Numbers, highest numbers of illegal immigrants coming in, maybe ever. And... Um, and, and that, uh, those immigrants are also being absorbed into the labor market. And indeed, a lot of people are suggesting that the economy is doing as well as it's doing because of uh, the illegal immigra immigrants coming into the country and, uh, and working. And, uh, and when you work, you create economic activity, which creates opportunities for people, which creates jobs and brings in capital, which creates uh, more jobs. So generally... Immigration is good for an economy, and uh, whether it's legally illegal, what matters is not whether it's legally illegal. The only thing that matters for the economy is that they're working, right? That they're not on welfare. And of course, if they were legal immigrants, it's uh, unlikely that they get welfare. Uh, so they have to work, and work is good for the economy. The more people work in an economy, the more the economy grows. So it could very well be that a lot of this is a consequence of the historical high levels of illegal immigration. All right, let's talk a little bit. Let's talk uh, some about Israel. I know we talk about this a lot, but there's just a lot going on. So um, let's talk first about the, the, uh, the uh, aid workers who were killed. Uh, you know, Israel accidentally killed seven um, uh, world uh, kitchen uh, something workers, aid workers. Uh, this is Jose Andre, the famous chef's uh, charity that goes around the world to uh, areas, areas, uh, where there's a shortage of food and uh, and uh, and provides uh, and provides for that and and provides uh, provides food provides uh, meals. Uh, uh, seven of the aid workers were killed, and the world went apoplectic. The world just went nuts. I mean, uh, uh, Israel is now uh, the devil. It has been completely demonized. There is nobody worse in the world uh, than Israel. Uh, because in a war zone, uh, aid workers were accidentally shot at. Um, this is what happens in a war zone. This is the risk you take by going into a war zone. Uh, this is not the first time. This is not the last time in a war zone. Uh, aid workers will be accidentally uh, fired upon and accidentally be killed. Uh, to, you know, to blow this out of proportion as the world seems to be doing 
and as the Americans seem to be doing, is just ghastly and, uh, and ridiculous. Now, Israel has already dismissed two senior officers in their drone, um, in their drone uh, um, uh, units. Uh, they've dismissed them over the, uh, the mistake that has led to this. Uh, they've also reprimanded a number of senior officers. But it's not clear. It's not clear that this is, uh, any of this is justified. Or is this being done because the world is, is going nuts and everybody's freaking out and everybody's flipping out uh, because of this? It's sad whenever somebody is killed uh, who is innocent and these people were innocent and they were trying to help out. But the reality is that this is what happens in war. And, and the, the, the blame for this lies squarely with Hamas. Every death in war uh, is the moral responsibility of those who initiate the fight. Uh, Israel has, uh, you know, about a third of all the Israeli casualties in this war uh, are the consequence of friendly fire. I mean, Israelis have killed Israelis, never mind aid workers. Uh, they didn't do it by, on purpose. They're not killing other Israelis on purpose. They're doing it by accident. Accidents constantly happen in warfare. Uh, when I was in military intelligence, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I witnessed at least one case of military incompetence and one case of just complete accident where, uh, where an Israeli pilot basically took out a whole tank unit, Israeli tank unit, thinking they were Syrians. And why he thought they were Syrians, who knows? Because they were clearly labeled and, and communications happened. But most of the casualties in the first Gulf War that the Americans took, most of the casualties were friendly fire. So it... You know, this is, again, this is what happens in war. And, and, and all these people in the media making a big deal out of this, shame on you. Shame on you for not bringing the context. Shame on you for not understanding what is it. And, and the same to Jose Andre. Shame on you, Jose Andre, for implying that this was done on purpose. I understand that you're upset because your people got killed. But, and it's sad and, and you know, I, I get it. But... This is war. You send people into war zones. There is a good possibility that this will happen. So it's just disgusting the way the world responds. Biden administration flipped out. Uh, the Biden administration um, basically uh, basically telling the Israelis that, it, that, that you know, they, they, they better investigate this. They better do what's necessary. And then they better increase the safety of civilian, civilians. And they better do this and they better do that. And they better increase the amount of aid going into the Gaza Strip. Uh, and uh, there really is a sense now that the Biden administration, the people within the Biden administration are re ready to flip on Israel and become full on anti-Israel. And a lot of this has to do with the elections. I mean, the, the reality is that Biden ha is going to have a hard time winning Michigan without the Arab vote in Michigan. Um, he's going to have a hard time winning uh, anyway. Uh, particularly in the swing states. He's going to have a hard time winning in the swing states if he doesn't get the far-left vote, if he doesn't get the youth vote. Young people in America are dramatically anti-Israel. Indeed, surveys right now of Americans showing 65% of Americans are, of, 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 um, you know, uh, object to the way Israel's handling the war. 65% and maybe more after this last occurrence. It could be up to 70%. That means a significant number of Republicans and a, a majority of independents and a majority of, of Democrats have flipped to being anti-Israel. It was much, it was uh, over 50 percent supported Israel when the war started, and now 65 to 70 percent um, uh, are against Israel. This is, uh, by the way, uh, uh, what happened with the with the food kitchen is part of the consequence of Netanyahu. What is it? What's the word? Uh, you know, delaying, 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 right? Diddling. I don't know what you call it. It's unbelievable to me. And I've been saying this on day one. You, you, you can go back and check. I've been saying this on day one. This had to be a fast operation. The slower it is, the more accidents there will be, the more civilians will die, the more the world will turn against Israel, the more, the more difficult it will become. So now how are they going to go to Rafa? Who's going to support them going to Rafa? I mean, the U.S. is literally threatening to stop shipping weapons to Israel. Um, 
How long has it been since Netanyahu said they were going to Rafa? Two months? It's truly absurd. Uh, it, you know, the war should have started. I mean, Israel should have uh, engaged uh, with ground troops much earlier than it did. It should have done this much faster than it did. And it should already be in Rafah. I, I know they haven't finished cleaning up the rest of Gaza and they want to clean up before they go to Rafah, but they needed to have gone and then cleaned up the whole of the Gaza Strip at the same time. Um, I know this operation is super difficult. I know that they've done an amazing job in terms of minimizing Israeli casualties. Good for them for that. But the longer they wait, the harder it's going to be to actually defeat Hamas. The latest is the Americans are pushing Israel. We need a ceasefire. We need a ceasefire. We need a ceasefire. But the barrier to ceasefire has been over and over again. Hamas, not Israel. Israel has proposed more and more and more accommodation. And the more accommodation they offer, the more Hamas says no. Uh, even the Israeli Supreme Court, here you go, even the Israeli Supreme Court, um, uh, typical Israeli, right? Typical Israeli Supreme Court, which is uh, on the left, is now saying there's not enough humanitarian aid getting into the Gaza Strip and they want the government to explain itself. It's truly, truly unbelievable. Truly unbelievable. All right. Uh, okay, one, uh, so one other issue relating to uh, Israel, um, and again, this could have dramatic impact on, um, on America as well, as, as uh, I talked about, I can't remember, I think it was Friday, or, or whatever, whenever I get, did a show before I left. No, it wasn't Friday, it was Monday. Uh, today's Friday. Uh, Israel has, uh, Israel attacked um, a building within the compound, within the Iranian embassy compound in Syria. It took down a building, 13 uh, senior people within the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard or, or people associated with it from either Lebanon or Syria were killed, uh, including three very, very, very senior officials, very close to the leadership in Iran. Iran since then has, uh, has uh, threatened uh, severe consequences. Uh, this morning, the Hezbollah uh, said this is a new chapter and, uh, and expect severe consequences. Uh, the uh, Hassan Nasrallah in a speech this morning, um, he says, this attack marks a turning point. There's what preceded this and, and, uh, and, it, and, and what comes after it. So it's what before and what comes after, and what comes after is going to be completely different. Uh, so Israel is, 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 I think, on alert for a potential, um, uh, you know, a potential uh, attack on the, in, the, in, in the north uh, from Hezbollah. Uh, it's also the case that this morning there was a report of a, a massive cyber attack, a large-scale cyber attack on the Israeli Ministry of Justice of all ju uh, ministries uh, that is probably uh, probably origins in Iran. So Iran will probably try to disrupt Israel through cyber attacks. This will be interesting to see how Israel's cybersecurity holds up. And at the same time, um, uh, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what actual what 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 is launched uh, towards Israel uh, in terms of missiles? There is also um, there is also the expectation that American bases in the Middle East might also be uh, attacked by Iranian affiliated groups. On the other hand, Iran might decide to keep America out of it and just go after Israel and make it just with Israel. Uh, potentially, you could see Iran launching Iraq, the the Iranian affiliated groups in Iraq in Syria, in Lebanon, and the Houthis in Yemen, all in a coordinated effort, uh, launching drones and uh, missiles towards Israel, really testing the Israeli missile defense system uh, with missiles coming in basically from every direction and all fronts. Uh, this is what Israel is, is getting geared up for and getting ready for. Uh, it'll, be, uh, it'll be interesting uh, to see what happens if if uh, if the uh, um, if they you know if 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 Iran really wants to take on Israel directly, uh, that would if they launch missiles from Iran, that would launch that would basically signal Iran as a legitimate target for for Israel to attack directly, which it never has, uh, at least not 
it has covertly, but not overtly. Uh, so um, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. Um, now, you know, Iran has to be careful because, I mean, I think, because if it attacks on a massive scale, um, it's in trouble. Israel has ground-to-ground -ground missiles that can hit pretty much any target in, certainly in any target in Iran. It, it has uh, the ability to send uh, airplanes uh, to Iran, although uh, it, I, I think the U.S. would have to be at least give a thumbs up for that. Uh, it has the capacity to really hurt the Iranians, and, and whether Iran wants that full-on engagement with Israel, hard to tell, uh, hard to tell. It, it would be interesting. I, you know, we will see. We will see. So a lot of suspense around that. All right. Um, let's see. Um, so a lot of, a few crazy um, domestic um, domestic stories. So this is a story out of Seattle. Uh, the Seattle public schools, public school districts, have made a decision to shut down 11 schools that are dedicated to, 11 schools dedicated to highly capable learners, gifted students. Um, they include three elementary schools, five middle schools, and three high schools. Uh, one of the problems with these schools, or the main problem with these schools, is uh, these schools have uh, a, a dramatic overweighting, uh, overrepresentation of white and Asian students. Uh, they are one of the least diverse gifted programs in the country. So the solution uh, to this from the Seattle Public Schools is to shut these schools down. They will send these kids to regular schools. In these schools, by the way, these kids form a cohort from when they're very young, and they go through um, uh, they go through elementary, middle school, and high school as a cohort. So they're studying together, and and there's a lot of stability there, and they feed off of each other, and they advance as a cohort. Uh, they are now going to break up the cohort, send them to their neighborhood public schools. The uh, the school districts are aiming to create. Uh, you know, some special programs for highly capable students in the neighborhood schools, but they will be exposed to a diverse student body and they will break up the cohorts so the students will be in different classes with different kids um, uh, throughout. This is all part of, as you would expect, the attempt of the um, Seattle School District to deal with equity and historical inequality uh, or inequity, and uh, the idea here is always, whenever you see inequality, equity discussed, it's always the case that the solution to it is going to be penalize the able, knock the able down, make it harder for the able to be successful, uh, uh, chop down the tall poppies. And, and I, I really, this story, I can't think of anything more evil being done today in America uh, of all the things that woke and schmoke and everything else does, there is nothing more evil than trying to knock down the, the quality of education that the smartest kids get. Uh, there's nothing more evil than taking talent and ability uh, and, uh, and uh, repressing it and suppressing it. Uh, you know, and and all, of us suffer, all of us suffer when that happens. Not only these kids are suffering, and it's horrible, because they, 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 they will never be able to completely live up to their potential, or at least the school district will try to make it impossible for them to live up to their potential. But all of us suffer, because these are the people that start companies, these are the people that become scientists, these are the people that are going to engineer uh, the, the sediments on Mars, these are the people that are going to create new drugs that extend human life or that, or that cure diseases. These are the people that actually in a significant way, make a difference in the world. They do. That's the reality. People with high levels of intelligence are the people who have the potential to really, really make a difference in the world in terms of changing the world for the better from a, from a business engineering uh, you know, and, and scientific perspective. So suppressing them, hurting them, hurts all of us. And yet the goal of the, event, of the egalitarians is destruction. The goal of egalitarians is 
you know, destruction of the most able, the goal of the egalitarians is fundamental nihilist, fundamentally nihilistic. It's nihilistic and it's, it's depressing and sad and horrible. And again, I can't think of anything worse that could be going on. This is the consequence of egalitarianism. There's no more evil in ideology out there, literally no more evil in ideology out there than, uh, than egalitarianism, uh, whose goal is to quash, squash ability. I hope parents of gifted kids, of talented kids, leave Seattle. They just leave or take the kids out of public schools and put them in private schools or get out, get out of Seattle. Uh, it, it, it really is depressing. Um, all right, talk about another depressing story. I mean, there's a bunch of them. Another depressing story. So uh, we've talked about squatters. Squatters, squatting has become a big deal, a big issue. It turns out that in San Francisco, there is a group called Homes Not Jails uh, that actually uh, helps squatters, finds homes to squat in, trains them on how to get the law on their side. Uh, here's a, a quote from, I guess, their website. Um, there are two basic problems squatters have in gaining tenants' rights. They're not paying any rent. They're living there without the landlord's permission. Ooh, yeah. I mean, th those are both big problems, right? But as impossible as it seems to get past these hurdles, it is doable. Talk to us. We can explain to you how it's doable. Um, you know, so for example, they write, the land source permission does not necessarily have to be explicit. Permission or written down. It doesn't have to be explicit or written down. A rental agreement can be written or, or implied by the conduct of the landlord. Thus, many squatters have found themselves in a squat which the landlord has known about and has given up for whatever reasons. Yeah, given up for <laughs> whatever reason. Trying to get rid of them. Squatters can make an argument that when discovered by the landlord, they made an oral agreement with him. Otherwise, they, in other words, they can lie, to live there in exchange for maintenance and security of the property. So squatters can lie that they have an agreement with the landlord. Even if the landlord denies that such an agreement happened, that'll get them into court, that'll get them into the process, and that'll, uh, that'll uh, uh, slow things down. In San Francisco, Homes Not Jails actually provides a, a link to a list of vacant properties in San Francisco that are ripe for the taking. So actual addresses where you can go and squat. Um, so it, it really is uh, unbelievable, unbelievable that this is allowed, right? Uh, I mean, basically what this website is, is encouraging criminal activity. It's encouraging people to break into other people's home, destroy their property, and take over their property and steal it from them. Uh, it is it is a, uh, a, 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 a a really disgusting phenomenon. And it turns out, it turns out that Homes Not Jail website are really just the San Francisco Tenants Union, um, uh, which is a nonprofit, right, which is highly connected politically, and uh, is is lobbies to shape city housing policies and has been doing so for decades. So we now have the San Francisco Tenants Union focused on encouraging squatters in the city of San Francisco. I mean, it's, it's insane. And, and in the land of property rights, in the land of the American Constitution and Declaration of Independence, it seems like there's nothing people can do. The, 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 the court system is so... Um, bugged down, so ineffective and so inefficient, and the laws are so anti-landlord Lord, that, yeah, I mean, this is all driven by altruism. It's all driven by a, a lack of any kind of understanding of what rights mean. There is no such thing like squatter rights. There is no such thing as, as these invented rights. Um, it, it, it is truly truly uh, 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 horrific uh, the, the state of so much of this country. Okay, finally, um, the Biden administration, one of the things the Biden administration is working on, of course, is 
more electric vehicles. Uh, this will solve all the problems in the world if we just drove in electric cars. Well, one of the programs is a rule that is going to requ that is requires already roughly 25% of all new semi trucks, those big trucks on the highways, or similar heavy duty vehicles to be electric by 2032. That's eight years from now. Now, the rules about uh, uh, passenger cars are even more stringent. Two thirds of them by 2032 have to be all electric. This is new cars, uh, but 25% of all semi trucks. Now, this is insanity, right? Semi trucks uh, travel for hundreds of miles, sometimes thousands of miles. Uh, a, a semi truck can often do about 1,000 miles on a uh, tank full of diesel. Can do it with electricity. Um, electricity would barely get them a quarter of that, if that, maybe a, a tenth of that. A long haul electric truck has a maximum range of 500 miles. Right? So, you know, uh, so it's 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 half. So you're going to have to have a lot more stops, and of course, filling up diesel. I don't know how long that takes. Doesn't take that long versus charging electricity, a lot longer process to charge electricity. Um, also, diesel power semi-trucks, the cost is about $160,000. All electric is $457,000. Who's going to pay that difference? Who's going to pay that difference? Right. That's, uh, by the way, with the sleeper. That's with the sleeper cabin. Without a sleeper cabin... Uh, without a sleeper cabin, you got 117,000, and electric uh, electric is 211,000. So basically, electric is double to to you know double to two and a half times uh, the diesel, and uh, and you can only do 500 miles, whereas diesel trucks can do a thousand to two thousand miles on a single tank. Uh, it's just the numbers are just insane. Now, long run is crazy, insane is going to raise the cost of doing everything in the United States and lower our standard of living and quality of life. And that's why uh, the fact that the economy is doing better, and it is doing better in spite of your objections, uh, does not change the fact that long-term the Biden administration's economic policy are destructive to long-term economic growth and long-term economic prosperity. You can trade the short-term for the long-term. And in this case, that's exactly what they're doing. All right, I think that's everything that I have covered. Um, let's see, we've got a bunch of super chatters. We've got a couple of super chats also from the from the show um, the other day. Um, and um, let me see, I wanted to thank somebody here who gave 50 bucks. Where is it? There it is. Uh, Siberian gave $50. Thank you, Siberian. He says, happy Friday, you're on. Happy to catch you live. Appreciate that. Were there any other stickers? I'm sure there were, but I missed. John did $10 sticker. Thank you, John. We'll get to John's question from last time in a minute. I want to remind you the Ayn Rand Institute is the sponsor for the show, one of the sponsors for our show. The deadline for applying for scholarships for the uh, OCON, for the Objectives Conferences, a fantastic conference. Um, spent with four or five hundred people who, who share your values, share your philosophy, share your love of Ayn Rand, uh, and great lectures and just great people. Uh, you know, the deadline for scholarships for that is uh, April 15th, so 10 more days. Uh, you can apply at aynrand.org slash start here. And then uh, the other sponsor is Alex Epstein. Alex, of course, is uh, the author of uh, Energy Talking Points and uh, the creator of, well, the, the, the mind behind uh, Alex AI, which answers questions as if you're asking Alex, as if Alex is answering them on all topics energy. It is, it is an AI bot that is now being used by congressmen and uh, energy executives and policymakers. Uh, and uh, you should be using it too. So I encourage you to go to alexepstein.substack.com 
alexepstein.com, alexepstein.substack.com. Subscribe to the Substack. Subscribe to the Energy Talking Points. And uh, if, if, if you have a use for it, or at least check out the Alex AI, which is pretty cool. I'm, I, I still have to get back to figuring out how to create a Iran AI, um, but, but uh, uh, that, would be, that would be cool as well. All right, let's go to our uh, Super Chat, and uh, we, will go, we will go for there. Uh, John, uh, this is from uh, two days ago, from uh, my, attempt, my attempt at doing a show from Sao Paulo, Brazil, says, have you ever changed your mind of someone? You have you ever changed the mind of someone you're debating mid-debate? I'm guessing it's rare as changing someone's mind is a gradual and time-demanding experience that requires effort and honesty by one by the one being convinced. I don't think so. I don't think I've ever changed anybody's mind during debate. And and look, in a debate, you're not in the mind frame of. Uh, uh, is he changing my mind? You're in the mind frame of how can I undermine this argument? How can I uh, make my argument? Uh, how can I uh, challenge what he just said? I don't think your mind is open to being changed during a debate. Certainly, I've said things that have challenged the other side. The other side has said things that have challenged me. Uh, you might not have an answer right on the spot, uh, but I don't think I don't think I know of any occasion when, uh, it, 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 you know, mind is being changed in a uh, in a substantial way. Now that that is not true of the audience. I do know of a number of people who uh, whose mind was changed who were in the audience. Uh, so on a number of occasions, uh, people have come up to me and told me that they attended one of my debates, and as a consequence of those debates, their mind was changed and ultimately led them to read Ayn Rand and to follow me and do all the other stuff. So um, uh, it is uh, it is very. Um, uh, it is, you know, it, 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 it is definitely the case that uh, you can change the mind of the audience uh, during a debate. And I know that I have because people have reported that their minds were changed. Thank you, John. Um, Robert says, a birthday shout out to the love of my life. Happy birthday, Amy. Amy Nasir. Happy birthday, Amy. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Thank you for contributing to one book show on Amy's birthday. That's very nice. Um, Naser, Amy Naser. Yes. All right. Uh, Clark, do statists seek to lock in wealth rather than destroy it? If you look at Europe and South America, most wealth is intergenerational for hundreds of years. They seek to destroy wealth creation, and they seek to steal as much wealth as they can. What has happened in Europe and in, in Latin America, and I don't think most wealth is generational. Europe, Germany, UK, even France, they're all engaged in wealth creation. They've created a lot of wealth. Remember, a lot of intergenerational wealth was destroyed during World War II. A lot of factories, a lot of stuff uh, was destroyed during World War II. So a lot of wealth has been created since World War II. It's not necessarily intergenerational, but um, what what but what happens is that both in Europe and certainly in Latin America, I think people have become super sophisticated about protecting their wealth, about figuring out ways to shield their wealth from the powers to be. So, for example, I'm in Argentina right now. I read somewhere that Argentinians hold. Uh, uh, huge deposits of fat funds in foreign accounts that are unreported to the Argentinian authorities. Uh, the size of these accounts are larger than annual GDP, uh, than the annual Argentinian GDP. So they have figured out ways to have accounts in Switzerland or Cayman Islands or wherever that are, are not reported and they can preserve it. So the status would love to take that wealth would love to, to steal that wealth. But again, rich families have figured out ways to protect it, preserve it, and shield it from the statists. Adam, uh, thank you for pointing out the interest rates. People are eager for a rate drop, but they often forget that is done when the economy is struggling. Careful what you wish for. Yes, and, and more than that, the reality is that interest rates right now are... Um, at least 
uh, mortgage rates about where they were historically. That is, they're not unusually high. Uh, I, I've had mortgages at these rates in the past. Anybody who remembers back to the 80s and 90s and even early 2000s, these interest rates were not that unusual. Uh, and uh, so uh, interest rates are high right now. Real interest rates are high. The short rate is, is particularly high as compared to the long rate. Uh, so the yield curve is inverted. Short rates are higher than the longer rates. But the long rate, the rate that associated with mortgages, for example, and even the rates associated with uh, credit cards are not higher than they were in boom towns like the 90s. It's just that we've gotten used to zero to very, very low interest rates, artificially very, very low interest rates. Now, I think interest rates can be lower than they are right now. Suddenly, inflation comes down. But we lived during periods of negative real rates of return. That is, interest rates minus inflation being negative. And that's abnormal, distortive. And a lot of the problems in the economy, a lot of the distortions in the economy are indeed consequences of the, um, of the negative interest rates that we lived with for so long. So, you know, be careful what you wish for is not only interest rates will come down when the economy is struggling, but also if interest rates come down too much, they will again, as they did in the 2010, 20-teens, create more and more distortions in the economy which we will pay for one way or the other. And often we don't see the way we pay for it, so we think there's no cost. But believe me, there's always a cost. There's always a cost. Right, Liam uh, writes, on college campuses, the left is preaching that words are violence, but actual violence like Antifa riots and October 7th is social justice. Yes, that's right. And they've been doing this for a long time. I mean, the idea of words of justice goes down to the microaggressions that was started over 10 years ago, um, and uh, that is the precursor to kind of the woke insanity, but, but we already got signs of that back then. And yes, they, they, are, they are quite happy uh, to tolerate uh, real violence, like October 7th and, and, uh, and uh, Antifa, and they are snowflakes, they, they, they are wimpy, and, and uh, their emotions are hurt, and therefore it is a real injustice when somebody says something that offends them. It, it really is pathetic and it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's intellectually lazy as to, it's intellectually uh, fraudulent and it elevates again emotions to, and hurt emotions to the level of, hurting emotions to the level of physical violence, which is wrong on so many fronts and basically a precursor to, to, to silencing anybody who offends you and who gets to decide that, we all know, you know, the, 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 the dictator in charge gets to decide who is the offending party and who gets to be silenced. Hopper Campbell says, a part of me thinks, um, a part of me thinks everyone who's read Ayn Rand knows she's right. They don't have the courage to admit it. I think you're too generous to them. Uh, I also think you're too underestimate how difficult it is, how, I, how difficult Ayn Rand is for most people to accept or even to understand. So many people just don't understand her and, and how unusual and exceptional it is for people to actually get it. So I, I don't think people know she's right. Some people do, but I, 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 and they, they evade it, but I think most people, most people just don't get it. It goes right up, right? Joel. In Japanese anime, film, and video games, there's no wokeness, and Japan is, de is devoid of wokeness. In such a timeline, Japanese entertainment companies might have brought out Hollywood, so woke Hollywood would not exist, would have bought out uh, Hollywood. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so uh, that's great that there's no wokeness in Japanese anime. It really isn't much wokeness in, in a lot of cultures around the world. There's no wokeness in chi China. There's no, there's no wokeness in, even in Europe, uh, not the UK, but mainland Europe, there's very little of the wokeness insanity. Uh, but they're all challenged by other things. I mean, uh, uh, and, uh, and I don't know that the Japanese entertainment companies are successful enough to be able to buy out Hollywood. Maybe they are, but I, I don't know that they are. And I'm not sure that even if they were successful enough, 
that they could reform Hollywood because uh, you would need writers and directors and producers who wanted to produce movies that were not woke. And the challenge in Hollywood is not just some corporate decision that we're going to go woke. It's, it's the writers and everybody else who want to, this is what they want to produce. So uh, it, it's not as easy as Japanese companies just buying out Hollywood and shifting it. You, you need to have the talent as well. Oivind, um, I saw your debate with Matt Brewing, and I don't think he gets invited to a lot of parties. However, Norway came up. For your information, 10% of Norway's 400 richest people have moved, mainly to Switzerland because of dividends and wealth tax. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't know that about Norway, and I'm surprised it's only 10%. But um, a sign- I think it's a higher percentage in Denmark. Uh, I, I remember, I mean, a good friend of mine who's a, who's a billionaire uh, who's in Denmark left, and he lives in Switzerland. And um, even at the time when he lived in Denmark, he bought his car in Sweden. He had a home in Sweden, bought a car in Sweden because the, the taxes on automobiles in Denmark are like 400%. See, both the car in Sweden had Sweden license plates. And so they find ways around the taxes. And of course, he left Denmark. And then I was on some board of advisors for one of his funds, for one of his businesses. And we had a meeting and everybody on that board of advisors who was wealthy lived outside of Denmark. They either lived in London or in Switzerland. So yes, the talent leaves. The talent leaves pretty quickly. Jeffrey... Is there an objectivist position on circumcision? Well, there's no objectivist position on it because it's not a philosophical issue. Um, you know, and Ayn Rand never wrote anything about circumcision, but Leonard Peikoff has spoken about it. And, and I think the general view is that one should be anti-circumcision, that circumcision is, um, there's no reason for it, and there is a price that you pay. Uh, that is that... that um, the foreskin actually protects the sensitivity of the penis, and you lose sensitivity uh, with age if you if the foreskin is not there. So if you're circumcised, sex becomes, in a sense, less pleasure, pleasurable uh, physically because the, the 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 skin is just it 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 becomes desensitized, and with the foreskin, supposedly that does not happen. So. That, I think, is the best scientific evidence out there. And there's no, as far as I know, scientific evidence to suggest that circumcision is good for you in any kind of sense, in any kind of sense, right? Um, I, you know, uh, if, if there was a health issue, then it wouldn't be an issue of consent. Parents do a lot of things to children without their consent. So the, the, the consent is not an issue. The issue is, is there a price you pay? And the price you pay is that, um, again, that you lose feeling. And, um, and, and uh, I think that um, it's not, it, if that's true, then it's, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it, right? All right, John, uh, I guess this is the same question as before, just different. Better question, have you ever had someone you debated approach you later on it afterwards and tell you you changed their mind? No, nobody's ever done that. I, I, if, if it has, I can't remember, but I don't think so, no. Ian Meerkat, would you go back to identifying as Jewish if it meant you could get to take the space laser for a spin? Uh, by P.S., Gaza must be destroyed. Yes, I mean, if I could get a spin on a space laser... I would call myself anything, right? It, it's uh, the space laser sounds super cool, and if I can use it to, uh, I don't know, to uh, to uh, uh, tattoo some interesting word on uh, on uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene's forehead, then all the better for it. I have no idea where that question came from or where my answer came from, for that matter. Jews in space. This is a Marjorie Taylor Greene conspiracy theory it's about Jews with lasers. Um, that Dudo Bunny does true focus lie between rage and serenity? No, I don't think I don't think it has to do with that. Uh, true focus lies in focusing your mind. It's engaging your mind. It's putting the energy into focusing on the world, not just focusing in terms of the 
focus of the lens, but in terms of the focus, your mind is engaged, fully engaged. Christian Klein, if Iran would really directly attack Israel at the same time Hezbollah attacked and maybe West Bank uprising happened, you are staying out of the mess. Could Israel alone win on full fronts? I'm worried. Yes, I mean, I, I believe Israel can. It will be incredibly costly. Um, and uh, Israel will need help with ammunition and, and things like that. But uh, uh, Israel, you know, Iran is far away. Uh, we're not talking about the real risk of ground troops, although uh, Hezbollah could storm the border in the north. Uh, but no, Israel, Israel could sustain itself, could, in a sense, win. I don't know what winning looks like with regard to Iran, but it, it could, uh, in a sense, penalize whoever attacked it dramatically uh, without being wiped out. Uh, so I think you should be worried because there will be significant casualties on the Israeli side, many of them as civilian casualties, many of them in the north of Israel, where my parents live and, and where my sister lives and brother. So, uh, you know, it's not going to be pleasant, but um, Israel, I don't think this is the end of Israel if it happens. And, and if, if there was a real risk that it was the end of Israel, they would do it because that's what they want. They want the end of Israel. Um, can you try to get an interview with Masab Yusef? Um, yes, I will try. I, I've got a whole list of people I need to try to get interviews with, but I've, I, God, I'm, I'm behind on a lot of things, as you might have noticed. Joe, what is the f f fail free marketeer? Reagan never strong armed Japan into singing the pl signing the Plaza Accord. Bubble never burst, and the Japanese economy overtook the U.S. before the year two thousand. What if the f what if the false maybe that's false? What if the false free marketeer Reagan never strong armed Japan? into signing the Plaza Accord, bubble never burst, and the Japanese economy overtook the U.S. before the year 2000. Um, I, doubt that any of the, I doubt that the Japanese economy would have overtaken the U.S. before the year 2000. Um, I, it, what would have happened is the Japanese economy would have grown. Uh, we would all be richer today, everybody. The U.S. would be richer. Japan would be richer, dramatically richer. China would be richer. I mean, everybody in the world would benefit it from a stronger, more vibrant uh, Japan. I mean, it, it is, you know, Japan, uh, a lot of the problems that Japan uh, encountered were self-inflicted, had nothing to do with Reagan. Uh, the, 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 um, they inflated their currency. They created a massive real estate bubble, uh, other bubbles. But if somehow Japan had... Um, managed the affairs in a way that it did not collapse in 1991, I think. Uh, yeah, Japan would be much richer and the rest of the world would be far better off. So it, it would have been fantastic. Really phenomenal. Really phenomenal. Wes, thank you. $25. Really appreciate it. Kenny, thank you for the sticker. Really appreciate that. John, do you think every motivated action can be boiled down to an action that's motivated by love or fear, death, uh, in the movie Donnie Darko, they try and tear this idea apart by claiming there's a whole spectrum of emotions. I think there is a whole spectrum of emotions, but there's a sense in which every decision you make is guided by either your desire for life or your default on that. And uh, you could call the desire for life love. You know, I, I don't know if I'd, I'd go that way, but it's, it's basically every choice you make is either pro-life or anti-life. And then that's a, either for life or for death. And uh, that affects everything you do. And, uh, you know, so it's it, 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 while there is a spectrum of emotions, those emotions can be categorized as pro-life, pro-death uh, emotions. Uh, but the fundamental is life and death. So it's not just love and fear. There are a lot of emotions, and all those emotions are, can be categorized life, death. Uh, but... It's a choice you make, you, have, you know, and it's a choice to focus your mind and therefore focus on life. And it's not like you think life, death. It's like, is your whole orientation towards one or the other? It's what guides your thinking. All right, John, also, the writer basically ignores the fundamentals of the actual idea itself and promotes pragmatism through Donnie, and then they even ad hominem the guy 
who came up with the philosophy by making him a child predator at the end. Ugh, that sounds horrible. It sounds really, really bad. I haven't seen that movie, I don't think, uh, Donnie Darko, but that sounds really horrible. Uh, Michael, uh, is AI responsible for these good economic numbers? Uh, to some extent, not, not a hugely yet, but to some extent, a lot of capital flowing into it, a lot of jobs being created, a lot of very high wages, very high wages in the AI space right now. Uh, that's the thing if you want to have a high paying job and you're going into school right now, computer science and AI, you'll make a, you make a lot of money. Uh, so uh, I don't think it's AI yet that's affecting this. AI will have a, a much greater effect longer term. Bree, landlords should claim the squatters' rights laws are a de facto eminent domain taking. They should sue the parties and state and uh, to buy the properties, force the state to buy the properties. I, I, that makes sense. I, I mean, the bottom line is I think they need to take this to Supreme Court. They need to challenge these squatter laws. I think there are a number of... Um, one of these legal, uh, uh, you know, uh, these uh, legal nonprofits that sue the sue over these kind of things. I'm hoping they sue over these laws and they go to the Supreme Court, and these laws get overturned as a significant violation as they are of property rights. Frank says, "What do you do if you find squatter in your condo? Hire some thugs to, you know, to get them out of there. I, I mean, if the police won't do it." It's hard in a condo because you have security below. It's, it's harder. It's one of the advantages of living in a condo. Joel, you missed my early super chat on Japanese economy. I was talking about a world where the Japanese bubble never burst and their economy kept booming and surpassed the US economy. Yeah, I answered that, right? And I said um, that that would be a win-win for everybody. There's no losers if that happens. That is uh, the, the, the idea that the bubble doesn't burst and that the Japanese economy surpasses, let's say, the U.S. economy by the year 2000, that's good. How is that bad? In any respect, that is good for the, would have been good for the Chinese economy to have one more robust, thriving uh, marketplace, right? So um, I want every country in the world out there to have a thriving economy that can surpass the United States economy. That, that is good for everybody. We do not live in a zero-sum world. It's all a uh, it's ads, right? So there's nothing wrong with the, with, with the Japanese economy becoming bigger and surpassing this economy. Um, I, I, you know, whether that is possible with a shrinking population uh, over the long run is questionable, but by the year 2000, maybe they would have surpassed the U.S. and then they might have faded a little bit. But, but yeah, that, that would have been great if the bubble had never burst or if there'd never been a bubble to begin with. Let's say there'd never been a bubble and the economy kept booming, then, again, that's all good. All right, Thomas. Hey, Ron, what's the difference between objectivism and hedonism? I feel non-objectivists often describe objectivism and hedonism. Well, huge difference. Hedonism is basically focused on momentary short-term pleasure. It's basically focused on emotion. Uh, objectivism is focused on reason. It's focused on rational values. It's focused on identifying your rational long-term values, the values that will make your life better over the long run. That might even involve very hard times right now. It might involve working really, really hard. It might even involve some pain, for example, while you exercise. Uh, and it, so it, it, it's not an issue of momentary or short-term pleasure. It is an issue in objectivism of what is truly good for you over the long run, recognizing, and this is another big, big, big difference with hedonism, recognizing the fact that you are a conceptual being, you're a being of reason, and therefore when you think about what's good for a human being, it's not just what's good for a human being materially, but what's good for a human being qua as a conceptual being, as a thinking being, and that is, is, is something that the hedonists evade completely. All right, this will be the last question. Daniel snuck in a question, but I, I, I really have to go. Uh, Daniel says, I agree that masculinity and femininity stem from man's efficacy in engaging with reality qua rational animal. Do you think modern conceptions of each, Prager, Manosphere, feminism, result from Rousseau and Marx ideas? Yes, I definitely think Rousseau has a huge impact 
uh, the naked savage and, and that whole perspective. Uh, I think, I don't, I mean, I'd have Marx in the sense that he's a materialist, yes, because, you know, he divorces, uh, he divorces from the mind and, and a lot of people, uh, if you're a materialist, then muscle play a big role. Men have more muscles than women, so that's the fundamental difference. And there's a lot of other bad philosophy out there that basically influences and impacts the way we view masculinity and femininity. But if you understand that fundamentally man is a man of, 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 of the mind um, and, and therefore reason and then acting based on reason, then that is how you have to perceive uh, masculinity and femininity as different ways in which that gets manifested. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I don't think, I, I, I don't think, given that that philosophy is new, I, I, I think that that is a, that is going to take time for that kind of conception. And, but it is going to be interesting because as, as economy becomes more mind dependent, AI, it's suddenly going to become more mind dependent. We're going to have to adjust our masculinity, femininity, ideas about masculinity and femininity to take that into account. To be successful in the physical world out there is to be a thinker. This is the whole revenge of the nerds, the whole revenge of the nerd phenomena that is Silicon Valley, right? Here are incredibly successful men, uh, primarily men, who are not masculine in the traditional physical sense, but masculine in a sense of mastering their environment, but primarily using their minds in order to do it. All right, guys. Uh, a lot more to say, I'm sure, about that. We will over the, over the months, years to come. All right. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate the support. I'm going to try to do a show tomorrow on Sunday and, and Monday. But I, I don't know, right? I don't know time-wise when, and I don't know exactly if I'm going to be able to. Tomorrow's a pretty busy day at the conference. Uh, it will have to be. I'll have to leave the conference in the middle of the day to do this. I might do that because some of the sessions are in Spanish. So I might just uh, uh, come and do that uh, during the day, but I might not be able to. So, uh, but anyway, I will let you know. I'll try to give you as much heads up. Thank you for so many people being on today. Thank you for the super chatters. I know this is not exactly a convenient hour for you guys. I'm amazed at how almost no matter what time of day I do the show, you guys show up. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Uh, my, um, and I tomorrow... Um, I'll tell you more about the conference, and of course on Sunday, hopefully I'll be able to tell you about Millet uh, and Millet's appearance, uh, assuming he's coming. All right. Uh, talk to you uh, soon, hopefully tomorrow.